What's good, DJ Leroy? What's good, Night Watchman? How you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. We've uh, worked our way halfway through Black History Month. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And you know what? Another Monday evening, and we're going to be, as they say, holding it down, man. Mm -hmm. Did you have a happy Valentine's Day weekend? I, I did indeed. Uh, you know what? Uh, I haven't heard any complaints from my wife, so I'm okay. assuming I, I did a good job. She's still in love with you. That's good. Uh, yeah. Mine too. Mine <laughs> too. <laughs> well, you know what? Hold it. Night Watchman, what's not to love? Come on, man. Come on. <laughs> <All right. laughs> And I'm, I'm not, really, and, and I'm not saying simply because I'm DJ Leroy. I'm just saying, you know, come on, you know. I'm, I'm going to leave that one alone. Thank, right thank you. Man. I, I agree. I concur. How's that? Okay. So, so Night Watchman, I want to actually have a, a conversation about asphalt, about the b-ball, about youth leadership, about all mm -hmm. those things tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, I guess uh, the many playgrounds that adorn Northeast Bronx, or more appropriately, Co-op City. Mm -hmm. So a number of these brothers I actually well, what grew do you up know with. About that? What do you know? I, hey, I grew up in the Boogie Down in, in Co-op okay. City in the Bronx, you know? And okay. so one of the first guys I'm going to bring up is this guy who you know pretty well because why? He was actually a part of the only two, repeat, only two losses of the New England Patriots by a New York team. And that, of course, being the New, New York Giants. And that person is uh, none other because he's given up Co-op City. He's now in, of course, Virginia, Mr. Rick John Davenport. All right. What's up, boss? All right. All right. How you guys doing? Good, man. Good. good. How you been? I'm good, man. Enjoy, so, enjoying the retirement life. You are? So yes, So I there am. is life, life after the MTA. That's what you're telling me. Yes, it is. No more trains. <laughs> <laughs> no more trains. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, you know what, uh, Rick Rock, you know we're going to have a nice little show because we got a couple of guys who remember we actually cut our teeth, cut our bones right on the court stand co-op. Right. So one of them is a brother by the name of Eric Hicks. And Eric has been the president of Game Over Sports and Entertainment since his partnership between himself and Mark Wald was formed in August of 1993. He is also the head uh, held the title of chairman of the board of directors when Game Over Incorporated in 1994. I didn't shoot. I didn't even know that because I could. He could at least let me get a damn piece of it, you know, something like that. <laughs> but without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, bring out Mister, of course, Eric Hick. What's up, Eric? How you doing, All buddy? Right. I'm doing great. I'm doing great, man. Great to be here with you guys tonight. Good to see you um, again. Likewise, likewise, my brother. And and you know what? All of us. Okay, all of us can agree that there were certain uh, folks who played ball in Co-op City who we looked up to, okay? Yeah. That we said that this is, yo, know, he, he's taking the game to another level. Now, Rick, you and I, we share the history of actually being able to actually claim that we beat the Bogart Five. We can say that. Yes, we can. A, a few times, right? <laughs> and they look but, down but, to But us. this brother, we <laughs> would all often look at in awe at, at the stuff that he would do. And he is uh, the general manager of River Bay Corporation. And for anybody who is actually from Co-op City that knows authentically that they oversee any and everything in Co-op City. And uh, as a, the general manager, this brother is one other than Mr. Noel Ellison. What's up, buddy? Hey, what's up, man? Thanks, everybody. Good seeing you. Curtis, Rick, you Eric, Bob. <laughs> Man, it's, it's like a reunion. You know it. <laughs> you know, a, 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 a reunion. mini reunion. Yeah because, we yeah. because we couldn't have all of the folks on, on the screen. But hey, I hear you. We got we got the ones, man. So how you guys doing, man? I'm doing all okay. Is good, man. Good. Very all blessed. Good. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. So so I would say now, I and I have to say this now, I did not play basketball, right, in any form or shape until I was uh twelve and living in Co-op City. That's when I started to play basketball. And and you know or whatnot, basketball had a real sacred place in Co-op. I mean, the games were hard fought. They were definitely uh, ones that, you know what, we would leave it all on the court. So so I got to ask you, man, Noel, what drove yeah. you to basketball, man? <laughs> well, strangely <laughs> enough, I was a, a young kid um, in a day camp, a summer day camp, and one of the counselors was this very attractive woman who lived on my block, <laughs> who kind of adopted me as a little brother and convinced my parents to get me a pair of Converse. Uh, 
Oh, you know, God. right. Yes. Now, back in my day, Converse was the sneak. The canvas ones was the sneaker to have. Yes. And, and my parents weren't big on paying that type of money for a shoe. Uh. And, <laughs> so she kind of convinced my parents that I would get a pair of Converse. I got black, <laughs> black low cut Converse with red laces. I'll never oh, forget. Oh, so and, you, right? and then I would go and she started fired, teaching huh? me playing basketball, you know. Uh, I and, and the luck of the draw was that she was so cute, all the real good basketball players would help her teach me to play basketball <laughs> simply to, to watch her. And just, yeah, so, I so, love it. I love it. Yeah, so so it, it started me off. It was, I guess it was a not so attractive woman. I wouldn't be anywhere on the court. <laughs> <laughs> See, you know what? Of course, we know that Howard Melvin... And, yeah. and the Blue Notes had that song, It's yeah. All Because of a Woman. So, all yes. All Because of a Woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. man. So, Eric, do you have a similar tale? What's up, man? How did how'd you get into it? Besides being the only brother that I know that was able to actually fit two of your feet in one of Bob Lanier's sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's funny because before I moved to Co-op City, I lived on 155th Street and 8th Avenue. Mm. And everybody in the world of basketball knows what that is. That's the That's Rucker. That's right. Rucker, baby. Mm. Yeah. All right. So I was in Colonial Projects, which was right next door to the Polo Grounds. Mm -hmm. But when I was first in, when I was a little guy, the Polo Grounds was still there. There was no Polo Ground Projects. I actually watched that get constructed. Mm -hmm. So I grew up on 155th and 8th Avenue, right across from uh, Rucker Park, uh -huh. and never can remember playing basketball one time. Not mm. once the whole mm. time. I, there. <laughs> I was going to be the Skelly champion of the world <laughs> okay. Skelly was my sport back then i mean i was melting wax in the tops and everything Skelly was my thing yeah. i didn't pick up a basketball till i moved to co-op city and you guys wow. know it's really weird because co-op city was 95 percent jewish that's right and, that's um, right and there was a basketball culture with them but i was the little black guy walking around with a hockey stick with them <laughs> <laughs> playing on the, on the courts uh, by the yellow schoolhouse. We used to set up hockey, and I was playing hockey. But then one day, once again, it was a woman in building one. And um, excuse me, in building two, her name was Adrian, And she uh, was a basketball player. I don't know if you guys remember Adrian. I think I do remember Adrian. Yes, yes. Adrian okay. could play. And the uh -huh. courts, you know, one thing about as Co-op City developed, there was a basketball court everywhere you looked. That's Every right. Every direction That's there was right. a basketball court. So at about 10, 11 years old, I got hooked. And um, you guys were my heroes, I have to say that, uh, on camera, because uh, I was a big time Dr. J fan. And I, you guys, uh, I know y'all remember, Curry Sarcher had this big afro, yeah. uh, <laughs> looking like Dr. J. And I was a couple of years younger, so he was my hero. And, 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 and Noel, we used to come over and watch you play, and Ricky you used to play with us. Uh, yeah, Ricky's brother Wayne. You, oh, we, we God. All, yes. Yeah, RIP. And he was a hell of a player, hell of an athlete, hell of a kid. Mm -hmm. But we formed our uh, we formed our own basketball culture. And anytime yeah. I get interviewed uh, about this whole um, evolution of basketball, for me, I, I always have to um, pay homage or, or bring attention to the fact that there was no basketball culture there. It's nope. not like you grow up in. Uh, Brownsville, Brooklyn, and you got the legends teaching the little right. ones and the older guys coming out and teaching us. We were out there making it up as it went along. Right. I mean, our, our heroes were Walt Frazier and Earl Monroe. So we were learning from TV. We were learning from that one time a week that the Knicks would come on in black and white on a Friday night at 11 o'clock watching right. those games. And we would learn and try to emulate them. And um, I just got hooked, man. I mean, the stories of me being out at the park that we played at, at six o'clock in the morning and practicing and this, that, and the other, I was crazy about it. I just, wow. you know, the basketball bug really bit me. And I was able to, um, you know, to I leave out a lot of stuff in between, but go from the parks to Co-op City, literally, to Division One basketball player. I was a point guard at St. Bonaventure University yeah. and yeah. Uh, people yeah. playing high school ball. Because you know what Truman High School was like. He had 12 spots for 6,000 kids. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody wanted to play. Everybody wanted to play. Yeah. And I wound up getting cut from Truman High School, which I was devastated. But in retrospect, from a business standpoint and a basketball standpoint, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Because it lit a fire under my behind that burns to this day. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it's transferred to business mm -hmm. now. And anytime something doesn't go right, 
in business, I get that feeling of, wow, I just got cut. And it just lights that fire. And, and beyond that, I deal, deal with a lot of kids now. It's nothing wrong with getting cut or having a setback. Is now, what are you going to do now? And I lived that lesson, and that's the lesson I got to put on to the kids today. But it all started out in Co-op City, in the park, watching you guys and playing with you guys and wanting to be like you guys. So I really, really and I know you laugh when I say this, I really, really give you guys a lot of credit for a lot of the things that I've done and the person that I've become, because you are all good guys. You are all good examples to follow. And people don't even understand how important that is. But you guys were, were good guys. When I say you guys were my hero and my role models, like I say, you guys laugh and joke. I'm very serious about that. I'm very mm -hmm. serious. honored to have yeah, you, yeah. you on that were there yeah. uh, Eric, for me. I, I, I'm I had, a young, impressionable kid. Absolutely. Eric, I drink that Kool-Aid for sure. And, and Noel may not necessarily know, know, but literally, Noel, you were an idol to us, man. Well, well, I you were serious, yeah. Because uh, you, because genuinely, besides the fact that you could play ball up the wazoo, you were just a good person. Thank you. And, and you don't find a lot of folks or whatnot yeah. who have those co combination of two things, you know, for, for mm. sure, you know. Mm. And, and and Rick, now certainly, uh, we 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 take pride in terms of uh, actually having a team that consisted of Michael Pert, Michael Jervy, mm. and and uh, you. And myself mm. on the short full in section two. You remember the short full yes. in section two? Yes. And, and that's where we did work against the Bogart Five, consisting of Dennis Wall, Moose, uh, Charlie mm. Robb, and Oval. Yes. Right? Woo! And, 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 and Rick, what, what drew you to basketball, man? Well, back, back when I was 11, I lived in the South Bronx, and um, we lived in Millbrook Projects in the South Bronx. and the NYCHA would have a tournament with the neighborhood projects. Mm -hmm. We would watch them all the time. We would play Mitchell houses, Mott Haven houses, and uh, Patterson houses. And mm -hmm. I would see them playing all the time. And I would go around shooting by myself. And then my mother and father told me, we're moving to Co-op City. And I, and I was upset, really, because uh, <laughs> I was leaving all my friends mm -hmm. to this area where I saw nothing but construction. <laughs> and oh, it was just a oh, and then um, and the, and it was a cultural shock also. Yeah, because That's right. a lot of white people. We were, yes, yeah. and, and and we were the majority <laughs> in the neighborhood, and mm -hmm. it was just I kept <laughs> sneaking away and moving, running, jumping on a train and coming down and visiting my friends down there. My, I would get in a lot of trouble, and then <laughs> parents, and then all of a sudden they built these uh half moon courts in section one. Mm. I, I would go out there and shoot around. And then I fell in love with the game. Mm -hmm. And um, okay. next thing you know it, oh Lord. Because yes. I, I was a Nick fan forever. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's Absolutely. I can tell you. Mm -hmm. No. No, th th that's the thing. I mean, like I said, I, I didn't play it until I moved up to Co-op City. And then, as you say, you're hooked, right? Yeah. And as a matter of fact, now, you guys know that my name was not Curtis. What was my name in Co-op City? Link. 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 Bam! Link. And, and, and you know who gave me that Dago nickname? Who's that? Frank Miller. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Frank Miller. <laughs> Oh, I know yeah. and, and so I thought it was maybe like Link uh, from the Mod Squad, Lincoln Hayes, right? Uh, no. That's what we thought. No, it was Lance Link, Secret Chimp. That sounds like Frank oh, Miller. Man. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> you just destroyed this 50-year image. Guy. I did that song. Uh, All these years yeah. was linked from my squad. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, it, it gave him a certain degree of cool, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so, Eric, we're not going to tell anybody, okay? All right. Come on, make it I hey. idolized the chimp all these years. I idolized it. <laughs> hey. um, wow. You yeah. can't make it up. So, wow. so, 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 gentlemen, okay, so obviously, uh, well, I think we didn't make it to the, we didn't get the offer from the NBA. Is that correct? Correct. Well, no, yeah, correct. Okay, all right. Correct. So, so we went on to do some other things now. Uh, and, and so you did your thing over at St. Bonaventure. Noel, what did you do after uh, high school and whatnot? I went to college. I, I, okay. I um, and and it's one of the things that you know. I grew up in a high school in, in a 
junior high school environment where mm -hmm. we played a lot of ball. Yeah. And and I guess then we had night centers where we could get together through the high school years, even though I played for my high school team. Mm -hmm. But I remember after being in college a number of years and coming back home, I wound up going to a court downtown in Manhattan, you know, because, you know, basketball, you had these nomads which that which I forget one? which one it was. No, because I, I was going to say West 4th or something like that, but go ahead. Go ahead. All right, so we went to go play ball, but, mm -hmm. you know, like basketball nomads, you hear that there's a bunch of guys playing ball in some court somewhere else in the city, and mm -hmm. you sort of get five guys and roll on down there to challenge <laughs> them, you know, and just see see how you stand, you know, and where you where you measure up in in, in a free flowing game of street basketball, right? But at this one particular time, I I reconnected with a guy that I went to junior high school with after college, and and we knew each other through the high school years. But he said to me, he said, you know, you were the first guy that left the neighborhood to go to college. Nice. And and nice. the thing was, you know, I I never saw it from that perspective. You know, yeah, I mean, I. Right. I, I look, my mother barely let me play basketball because her emphasis was always on the academics. Nice. You know, grades. Nice. Mm -hmm. You had to you had mm -hmm. to deliver school wise. Everything else was a was was free time and you know, I didn't care if you playing Connie Hawkins or any basketball <laughs> player. If you got to be home by seven, you better be home by seven. And because my mom would come and grab you by the air and pull you out, so you know, so the basketball life wasn't anything to her. It was like you know, it remind me of that woman Abishola on the TV with her son. You know, yes. right? you know, yeah. I came from that sort of environment. Right. So to hear this guy say that, to sort of realize that you can be an inspiration to others, it it it. I guess it, it read me very early to understand that while you may not be looking to see who's looking at you, people are looking at you and, and, and you always, you know, always, always, always have to comport yourself in a manner that, that expresses being a gentleman. Because, you know, like you said, when we moved into Co-op City, it was a 95% Jewish community. So right. black people were far, few and far between. Mm -hmm. And and you always kind of carry that, that notion that your behavior was not just a reflection on yourself or your family, but it been in generally the whole race of people who happen to live in Co-op City. Right. <laughs> and, right. And it's like. You know, so if I did something right. bad, all three of you would be victimized by it because people were thinking that you were potentially doing the same thing. Correct. So you always try to show yourself in the highest level of decorum or whatever. And mm -hmm. hopefully doing all that, hopefully it stuck throughout my later years and, and allowed me mm -hmm. to do some other things. Um, but, you know, proud people do better, I think. And, and in essence, the effort was to to remain proud and 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 proud collectively with a group of people um, who were black in, in, in a middle class neighborhood at the time. Absolutely. Beautiful. You, you, Eric, what's up? Tell me about in well, terms uh, of your, did you always know you were going to go to St. Bonaventure or were you, were you thinking, considering other options? Let me tell you something. I had never heard of St. Bonaventure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a crazy story because the year that I went to St. Bonaventure, they, um, the year before they had just won a national title. They won uh, the NIT, which back then the NIT was the biggest. It was something. NCAA that's right. Tournament. That was the thing. It wasn't the NCAA. It was the NIT. So yeah. I had known something about them. So I'm so naive. You know, it's so funny. Kids talk about Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. Do you guys ever remember discussing that in the park? We didn't know it. I mean, I didn't no. know it. Not Division One, Division yeah. Two, Division. Right. I knew Walt Frazier, Earl Monroe, and playing in Section One and Section Two Park, playing basketball. So I go to this school, and um, the first thing I do is I seek out the gym, and I'm out there, and I'm balling. And I'm playing with all of these guys, and, and you know, the guys are good and everything, but I'm holding my own. And I'm saying, wow, this is Division One basketball. I think I can do this. These guys, uh -huh. uh, you know, they're huge. Everybody's huge. <laughs> they can do everything that I can do, but they're twice the size. Because at that time, I was about 5'9", five, 5'10", five, 130 mm -hmm. pounds. Wow. All right. Wow. So after we finished running that, that first day, I go to those guys and I go, what year are you? Assuming everybody's the junior or senior because they're so big and strong. And they go, freshman. And I go, what year are you? <laughs> freshman. And I look up a dude about six, eight, six, nine, diesel can handle. What year are you? Freshman. And I'm, they were all freshmen. The upperclassmen hadn't gotten to campus yet. So right mm -hmm. there, my bubble busted. Yeah. 
You know, I was like, oh, this is ridiculous. And, you know, not playing in high school or anything like that really was a handicap, but I could right. play. And they uh, saw I could play. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Noel talked about his his parents. My parents didn't care nothing about, my mother didn't care nothing about basketball. It was all about education. You know, I had right. a little academic scholarship, and then, mm -hmm. I, and then my parents were paying for my education. Yep, so yep. once the coaches, the coaches and everything up there could not believe I never played high school basketball. The way nice. that I handled the ball, and they thought I could jump. Now back at home, I wasn't known to be a leaper, but in college, I could dunk it at five nine. I could dunk it a at five, well five ten. I could mm -hmm. dunk it a couple of different ways, and they thought that was amazing. You know, and I was like, if you think I could jump? You need to go back to section two. There's a whole park yeah. full of guys. That <laughs> That's right. Who never made it? You're right. You're right. Yeah, but you know what I tell the kids um, is, and, and how I deal with this is. St. Bonaventure being a team that had just won a national title and had the best recruiting year in the history of their school was not going to win one more game by putting me on that team. Mm -hmm. But what they did know is, A, I could play, and uh -huh. B, I wasn't going to embarrass the university. Uh -huh. I wasn't going to get in trouble. I was going to be a gentleman. Mm -hmm. I was going to uh -huh. handle my books, and I was going to be somebody proud. You know, they would be proud to put that uniform on because having a walk-on at that was unheard of. Mm -hmm. It was unheard of, but they was like, no, this kid can play and he's a good kid. We got to do something for him. So eventually I was able to call my mother up and say, hey, ma, guess what? And she said, well, I said, you know, that car, that new car you wanted to get? Yeah, you can go ahead and get it. School is free. And she couldn't believe it because <laughs> wow. we didn't know nothing about I mean, we didn't know nothing about basketball scholarships and things like that. We were just playing ball. So this yeah. just came as a shock to everybody. So I went from playing in Section 2 to walk running out on the court with 6,000 screaming, half-drunk fans every week. <laughs> and uh, it was really, really a, a shocking experience for me, but a great experience. And, and um, it's that experience that carries me through everything that I do in business to this day. Um, just the fact that I was determined. And, you know, because like I tell you, you know, we did crazy things. We had 24 flights of stairs in my building. I was running the stairs two, three times a day. You know, we were just uh, making it up. There was no trainer with the cones and the whistle mm -hmm. like these kids got now. We didn't have any of that. We made right. it up as we went along. But something I must have did, I was doing right. And it just paid off in the long run. And, and um, as I say, those are the lessons that I passed down onto all of the kids that we deal with now and the things that keep me going. It's all... It, it all follows the same path. It's all from the athletic career and the athletic experiences of what I draw upon, you know, uh, now in business. Gotcha. Perfect. Well, can you Perfect. tell us a little bit about um, how you went from that to the business you started? Okay. So check this out. We talk about Co-op City was a great training ground for me in that Co-op City was 95% Jewish. I'd say my university was 95% white. Mm -hmm. And we were all like, I mean, it was very, it was culture shock for me. Here I went up there with this big afro, gold chains, <laughs> this radio that was huge. You had and, a boombox you know, over there? Oh, I had a boombox. And I mean, <laughs> and at that time, it was, um, <laughs> everything was the Commodores and, you know, oh, Brickhouse, yeah. Zoom, all that. You know, I'm talking 1977, 78. So this is what we were into. Uh, so, um. I mean, it's it, it, it. Well, the question you that you had asked was, how did I do what now? Yeah, how did you get? How did you go from there to the business you started? Okay, so you know, like in order to like, um, you, you you wanted to um, have self esteem. So we used to the, the all of the white kids on campus wore Lacoste shirts. That was the little alligator. Uh, yes. All yeah. the black kids wore polo. Mm. All right. And then polo shirts got to be like $30 a piece. So I was like, you know, man, one day I'm going to come up with my own thing. So I remember in accounting class, I used to draw stick figures and this, that, and the other and try to design a logo or whatever because that $30 a shirt was ridiculous, especially back then. And eventually I um, just came up with the idea for Game Over. But before that in college, I actually had three businesses in college. I was, I was a busy guy. I was, I was a Division One basketball player. I was point guard. Then I was interning with a law firm. The, the school had two newspapers. I created and owned the second one. So there was a school newspaper and then there was my newspaper. And then I used to have a, um, a delivery service. 
that I did to all for all the students on campus, from the stores in town to the students on campus. We had a whole delivery service thing. So I, nice. the business bug was in me. And I mm -hmm. knew that I just was never going to get a job, man. I was like, I, I'm never going to work for anybody. I'm going to have a business. I'm going to have a business. So these things just, you didn't know it at the time, but they gradually, they were the stepping stones to where I came into starting Game Over years later. And Game Over was kind of symbolic because um, I felt that the the exploitation and the underrepresentation of Blacks in sports, whereas that Blacks, were, we were always on the court, but we were never behind the scenes. And um, that the game had to be over, that we had to get in there and be a part of the game, a part of all part, all aspects of the game. We not only wanted to be on the court, but we wanted to be in the managerial positions and, uh, you know, the business aspect of sports. So the game was over. And I always thought that um, college ball players were being exploited. They should be getting paid. That game needed to be over. Game over was kind of a movement for me that stood for anything that needed to be changed. The game was over and we were going to start it as a movement, but also as a line of clothing. So my logo is the guy walking away with the ball in one hand, rim in the other. I guess you can see it here. Thus game over. And uh, it just took off. I, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't realize that two words could branch out into so many things. I didn't even believe that I could trademark the two words game over because it was the last thing on every video game. So I just Absolutely. knew somebody was smart enough to trademark it. But mm -hmm. lo and behold, I was, ever, I was able to trademark it. You can't put the term game over on a T-shirt unless you pay me or you get my permission. Right. Go ahead, Amazing baby. People. Go ahead. Now my, now, my trademark is infringed upon more than anything. But I'm legally, sure. you shouldn't be able to do it. So I spend a lot of time sending out letters and threatening a whole lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> you know, that's kind of how it got started. And and I always, and I'll leave it at this, I always knew that if I found a business that I was going to be as passionate about as I was in basketball, that life was going to be very good. And, yeah. and, and, and um, you know, my, the, the years of pursuing the business were going to be very, very good. And it worked out. I mean, I'm excited to get up every day and do my business. And that's the same way it was with basketball. Couldn't wait till six o'clock in the morning, roll around, and then I'd sneak out the house with my ball and head over the car. So it's the same thing with business. It's been a great journey, but it all started with sports for me. Absolutely. Well, you know what? Uh, on, on that particular thing, uh, do me a favor, uh, Rick Rock, uh, please stand up. You see the shirt? Baby! Yeah! 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 yeah. 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 So, 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 Rick, now your journey was not, uh, uh, not the same so as a matter of fact, and I want to also thank you for your service because mm -hmm. you went into uh, the military, into uh, right. the army, right? I, and, right. And, and so you did your did your time there, and and I was surprised to actually see that your that your game had not improved. But you know what? And that, that's just me. <laughs> oh, wow! <laughs> no, no, I take that back. Yo, Rick, Rick was my go-to guy if I wanted a brother to take that stuff on the right side and take a jump shot. It's Rick Rock, okay? He's doing it. So, so Rick, tell He's us smooth. about it, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's so funny. You know, on my journey? Yes. Well, you, know, you know what? I graduated high school in 1974, and I decided to go into the military for three years. And, mm. and I went into the aviation field. And I was a mm. helicopter repairman for three years. And then mm. once I finished my three-year tour, I came into the real world, and uh, the military got me a job through... Uh, to work with uh, Pan Am, mm -hmm. and then Pan Am went in, went bankrupt. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh <laughs> Lord, they went bankrupt, so I had to look for work. And then my father told me, "Why don't you go back?" You know, I wanted to go back to school, so I went to Queensboro Community College, and I was taking civil service exams while I was in school. I did eventually graduate, but um, the MTA called me, and I started making money, and I started operating trains. And I made a career out of it. And, uh, and also having one of the best cars on the planet, okay? Just say that. Your, your Grand Prix. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Right. 1976 Grand Prix. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny. I it the whole time I was in uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, as soon as I came back to New York, they stole it off the street. Oh, oh man. Wow. I couldn't wow. believe it. That was my first car, you know. Life savings. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. 
and, and sure me. enough, and you also told me while you were there that you had seen one of the people who literally lit it up at uh, against uh, Stuyvesant because he played for Harron, and that was Cheese Lambert Johnson. Mm-hmm. No, I know Cheese. Oh, yeah. see, there you go. Me there you too. Go. Yeah. The, the brother could uh, ball. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, and guys, would you agree that at one point that New York was the epicenter for ball? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Noel, tell me some of the legends that you remember going up against. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess Marvin Barnes. Oh, um, sheesh. Super wow. John Williams and, 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 and played. Um, I played Al. Well, I played on a team with Al Skinner, who used to play with the uh, Mets. I remember Al Skinner? That's right. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. It was that. That was one. Of, it was on my. We played a game on my birthday, and, wow. and and it was in a tournament in Long Island, and I, it was my first time playing on this particular team. Mm-hmm. And I walked out there, and I knew a few people in the area, Roosevelt, Long Island, and oh, what? people. Dr. Would, J's hometown. Dr. J's hometown. Because Skinner, Skinner was one of Dr. J's buddies back That's in the right. day. That's right. It was him, and then there was a kid named Quentin. I think, it, but Quentin didn't play as much. But I, I knew them because I had friends out in Long Island at the time, mm-hmm. and I re- I remember that people were giving me it was my birthday, so I had some drinks and all that, and running out on the court feeling mm-hmm. a little inebriated. <laughs> and you know, and you know, and I had a game as many of you know. I used to like drive into the hoop. Yeah. But I felt that it, you know, if if at my state of mind, I better not. Uh, <laughs> <you know? laughs> right. So I got the ball and just jumped up and shot this jump shot, and it oh. went in. Oh. <laughs> and it said, All right. And I think the the next three or four times the ball came, I think it, it's something like I hit four jump shots in a row, mm, which nice. was unusual for me. You know. What I'm saying? <laughs> So, so I remember coming bound back on the defense because we was playing a two-one-two zone on defense, uh, and you know how you hear the kids that come to the court to see all the people they've heard about. Yeah. So I remember hearing one kid say, "Yo, man, I remember you told me come here for this guy Skinner." He said, "But who's that skinny sucker over there shooting all the jump shots?" <laughs> <laughs> you know. And at that point, I figured, you know, okay, I've arrived and, and started going out and. and you know, different parks, you started hearing that people knew my name and, and, yep. and had seen me play or talked about a game that I played. Nice. And, you know, and, and I don't, I mean, I say it because, look, I played basketball from a position of fear. Mm. I didn't want you to, I'm scared you was going to block my shot. I was scared that I was going to miss the shot. I was scared, you know, <laughs> and in essence, and and I remember the good brother Felipe Luciano in, on the yeah. 125th Street young where Lord. it was the, where yeah. the young law as well. There used to be a time before it was a state office building that there was a group of militant young people that took over that space. They uh-huh. called it reclamation site number one. That's right. That's and right. in those okay. days, so so I was thinking of going to Fordham University at the time. And, and as a pre-freshman, they took us over to where the site was and Felipe was lecturing. And I wow. remember him saying then, use fear to help motivate you not to make you run away in that sense. And and I guess, you know, you get these enlightening points in your life where you see something or hear something in the most normal, natural of ways that basically pivots your thinking in a manner that that, that lets you know you're still climbing the mountain, but you got to go this way and pay attention to that. But when he said that, Mm -hmm. the idea was, you know, look, it's nothing wrong with being afraid. It's just it's not too good to run away, you know, in the time in, in, in all situations. I mean, you know, clearly there's times you need to run and you better yeah. run is common sense. But but there's this thing where your mind sort of set should have should let the fear say, well, if I fail, I fail. If I succeed, I succeed and then take out all that drama. But nice. it was that point it sort of in, in, embraced my game a, a bit. And um some of the best moves that I heard the most chairs was me closing my eyes and hoping to go in. It's just you had a rhythm, you know, going at the time that sort of, you know, made it work. Because for me, basketball has always been like a jazz dance, you know, um, where it's, it's, yeah, it's like it's just a musical thing to me in that sense. And and I think, you know, when 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 you're in rhythm with the game and in rhythm with the with nature and for whatever purposes, it, it all seems to work better. Uh, and, and, like and, yeah, so once you get that that feeling, 
then then the, That's what whatever I mean. happens after that happens. You know, it, it, it makes it, everything else makes a way. Absolutely. Well, you know what? One of the things that I've kind of found out, uh, uh, certainly as I've gotten older, is you know what? Uh, I can't necessarily remember a lot of detail, right? Mm. But one of the things I do remember is from circa, I'm going to say 1983. Mm. And, and this mm. should be kind of close to you, uh, good old Eric, because you, were, uh, you and I were on the same team. And it was a tournament, and you know what? We're going to give homage to a, a Jerome L. Pickett. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. oh yeah oh yeah an og who used to play ball with us mm -hmm. right That's out right. there you know yeah. uh, and so the thus the birth of a tournament called the jerome l uh pickett memorial tournament mm -hmm. and circus uh, 1973 uh 1983 i'm sorry 83 yeah, yeah. we were on the same uh, team do you remember that eric is that uh was that the year we won it yeah ah. mm -hmm. <laughs> yes indeed yes well how yes, would i indeed. forget that <laughs> oh, okay. I'll, I'll give you something. Do you remember the color of the shirts? Green? Was it green? No, they were brown oh, with, somebody... with, with yellow striping. Yeah. Yellow, uh, yellow okay, because somebody striping. posted a picture of me on Facebook in a green Jerome Pickett uniform, and I don't know who did that. Uh, that, 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 that was not the team that but won. That year, that was that the year we beat Hatch Crew? Yes. 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 Uh, I have two questions for you, uh, Curtis. One, do you still have the jersey in your closet? Ah, I do. It, it's it's in storage, but yes, I do have it. Yes. Oh, and I want to hear the second question now. Does it still fit? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I'm not giving him the the, the do one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Yes. But no. Okay, so so Eric, do do tell in terms of uh, you know the, st the stuff that was happening. Actually, you know what? Noel, the big mm -hmm. question that I do have, how in heck did the partnership uh, happen between River Bay Corporation mm -hmm. and Game Over for the renovation of the courts? Wow. Well, I get, from my standpoint, it's, it's a long-term relationship growing. Mm -hmm. um, I remember... So, what's still growing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I love it. But, I love it. Okay. You know, it started off. I mean, look, I know you guys as young guys. I, I, I've watched you grow up. I mean, even when you used to have that spot where you were working out in Staten Island and uh, you left them and they gave you, I even drove out to Staten Island just to give you support because, yeah, yeah. you know, I always, <laughs> yeah. I always uh, felt that was necessary for me to do for people that I watched grow up and, and, and nice. want to encourage to keep moving forward. Right. But I think, um, and I forget where that park was in the Bronx. I think, you know, but it was, it was I don't know if it's considered the Valley, but oh. over on the other side of Boston Road, there was a yeah. tournament going on. Right. And I wind up going there just to see some interleague basketball because we didn't have any tournaments going on in Co-op City at that time. Mm -hmm. And when I sat in the bleachers to watch the game, I just happened to sit next to Eric. Oh, and, my God. And, and, and Eric had, at that point, I guess established inroads in the basketball universe of New York City mm, and right. had let me know that he had had this group game over and that the jerseys was made by him and the, the trophies was done by him and such. Mm -hmm. So we reached a point where I managed to talk to a guy that was working with what we call the Youth Activities Committee or YAC. Uh -huh. who, who evidently knew some rich guy that wanted to sponsor a tournament and would pay for the whole tournament. Wow. So wow. I said, well, let me pull some people I knew that could do it. I mean, I, I'm the manager that believes that, you know, I was told years ago, a good manager hires smart people and gets the hell out of the way and let them do their job. And, <laughs> and, and I think I've been getting pretty good at that, to be told. <laughs> you know? um, but, but when we talked about trophies and, and, and jerseys and that sort of stuff, you know, it seemed quite natural to reach out to Eric um, where we had sort of reconnected. I said, well, look, I'd already made the mistakes of getting the shirts, but at least I can hook the brother up with trophies. Mm -hmm. And he, mm -hmm. he gave the trophies to us. We, I mean, sold the trophies to us. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and it worked out because they were very nice trophies and, and everybody was, was together. And then we were, we sort of kept tacit communication with us because of places we just bumped into each other. Nice. Um, okay. We, we reached a point where, you know, I had become, I was be become general manager at Co-op City. Mm -hmm. and, and I was dealing with a 
what what we had managed to do is when we had we, we managed to build up our reserve funds um well i think when he started was under a million and by the time we got this thing going we had like five million dollars in reserves and money coming in you know uh -huh. because of better management i think at the time and we decided look it was time to start painting these things these kids we needed to do something for kids nice. you know nice. the headache is you know i mean co-op city as much as we love it um it, it's i don't call it a senior community but the seniors are very active and and as and, and in many cases, their vision of the world sort of has a predominant um, effect on on how life is in this community. Mm -hmm. And it was just my belief that that you know, um, if a child is born, the child is the blessing. And I, I remember a woman once telling me that when an old person dies, it's like a library burnt down. Wow. I thought wow. it was a very prophetic statement. Yeah. But my sense is, is that, well, while pe old people are alive and are being the library, they need to be a resource of materials for young people to do stuff. And and, and if by extension, library meant the community and the, and the, and the social interactions, mm -hmm. then, yeah, someone needed to put together these basketball courts to do what they needed to do. Nice. So and they and and we started putting money together to to sort of hitting them one by one, mm -hmm. and then I felt like look you know I needed to get you know in Co-op City we had those metal basketball courts that that, that was sort of like <laughs> shooting on a spring you know once hit the backboard it <laughs> flew away, and the sense was is that we had the type of community that deserved better, so I decided we would put new fiberglass backboards on on every court. Uh, and, and and as much as it wasn't my real ballywick, I called Eric and said, well, who can put up basketball courts, backboards for me? He said he could, and there it was. And as the, you know, so we set it up. Eric started going to the various courts and 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 started mm -hmm. putting up these backboards. And and then we we decided that we would have to do a whole overhaul of the courts in mm -hmm. in bellamy loop or what we call section four in co-op city four. that's right and, that's and it, where it, that's where the tournament was yeah oh, it, 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 was, yep. it was it was it was sort of the, the centralized spot for basketball in co-op city i mean every place else nice. was sort of an area that you worked at practice at you know um trained that as the case may be right. but normally when you walked into section four and got on that court you had to be ready to ball and, 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 and so, you know, so based on that legacy, you know, we decided that we would tear it up. Um, and look, we found some architects that, that specialized in, in courts. So it's pitched a certain way to allow the water to drain off faster after the rain. Excellent. Um, Excellent. The, the particular lighting is set up the so that it's sort of, yeah, so it doesn't bar, bother the people in the buildings. But at the same time, provides proper illumination for people to really play a decent game of court basketball without having to look up periodically at the lights and blind themselves. So <laughs> it, it was, you know, I mean, we, we, we went all out in, in getting engineering experts to sort of put the course together. Even some places we've got um, sprinkler systems for where we have um, foil, you know, flowers and bushes around there. We we put water fountains in there so kids could drink in that sense. I mean, it, it was... Damn. We're fairly well thought out. It, oh, I mean, very nice. Yeah, you can see oh, it up so, there. Mm -hmm. So where is this? Where is this exactly? This is in the Bellamy Loop section of Co-op uh -huh. City. Excellent. Right. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, I guess uh, we we have a tennis court on the side because wow. you know we had we knew we had people that like to play some tennis in there, mm -hmm. and the people who played tennis wanted those colors because that's <laughs> the colors of the Arthur Ashe Stadium. Ah, and, and, and very nice. You know, very nice. Wow. And then initially, then Eric's guys put the put the backboards up and and put the paddings around the poles. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see behind some of the basketball courts, there's a little mesh gate there that keeps the balls from running out on the other courts. And <laughs> and, and we set it up so there are three different line linings of the courts. One is made for high school, one is made for college, and the one in the middle is an NBA um, line court. Oh, so wow. you can play also, wow. I mean, it's still the same dimensions front to back, but mm -hmm. you know, you have those opportunities to do what you, what you want to do. And then on the bottom right hand side, you see there are three courts for kids that could train and practice their shots and, and, and whatnot. Wow. But, you know, but it, we, we, we went all out to try and do it. Um, 
you know, we, we initially got backlash from some of the residents because you can see cars are double parked all along the place. And, you know, they were worried that bad things would happen and, and whatnot. But we've got cameras all over the place. So there's nothing you can really do on those courts um, that won't be seen by one of the cameras that's monitored by our public safety department. Wow. So but but the sense was, you know, it, it's, it's sort of like you can build a church, but you need a pastor to bring some religion into it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and in essence, you know, Eric and Game Over had been that pastor that brought religion into the courts. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, I mean, they were a great success story because, number one, he and Mark grew up in Co-op City. And in and, and, and the Co-op City, in the early days of Co-op City, was primarily made up of blacks and, 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 and Jews. Yep. And yep. so to have, you know, the children of a Jewish family hook up with the child of a black family and put together an organization yep. for, uh, from Co-op City, then it, you know, you it, it was almost a moral responsibility to bring them to Co-op City to do some of this stuff, which is, you know, in, in essence, was his birthright. If if, if you yes. if you can understand where I'm coming from with that, and Absolutely. and and at that point, you know, he's 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 been excellent in what they've done. I mean, we we had people were complaining about the kids weren't wearing face masks during these last uh -huh. summers. And, yeah. and Eric, you know, designed and produced space masks for us that we wound up giving to the children throughout the community. So what and are they, you talking about? You got some uh, game over face masks here? We got game over face masks. Yeah. We got game yeah. over Riverbay face masks. They got Riverbay, yeah. Ah! Exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, the, and the kids, you know, at this point, the kids were wearing it proudly. I mean, every place I went, I saw somebody with one of those masks. Nice. And, and, and I think, you know, I... I we had this series where, where we had to convince people in the community that the children weren't up to no good. They they needed a place to play. They needed to get out, you know, energy. I, I remember back in my church days, my father used to tell the story about um, this Baptist church. And he said that, you know, the Baptist, the elders of the church or the deacons of the church came to the minister and said, you know, we're going to cancel Sunday school. And the minister said, why are you going to cancel Sunday school? And the, the deacon said, because the children keep breaking up the chairs. And the minister looked at them and he said, well, what would God rather you have, children or chairs? And I think, you know, we we have to deal with that yes. philosophy every time it comes to children, because children break stuff up. But yes. they've got to be allowed to develop. They've got to be trained. They've got to be led. Um, and, and the effort that we wanted to make sure is that we, we provide outlets for our children, not policing for the children in Co-op City. And I think that's what made this thing a, a, an overall success, this partnership an overall success. Well well said, uh, Noel, no, well so, said. Eric, and you Eric, know what? Can we hear um, from your side of all this? You know, huh? Well, you know, it's not Eric. a lot I can add to that, but here's, here's how, how it is for me. Uh, first of all, when Noel made that phone call to me, I was honored. I mean, this is kind of like my life comes full circle. And that Co-op City was the place that I loved to, well, I learned and fell in love yeah. with the game of basketball. And for me to have the opportunity to have any kind of imprint on the renovation of, of those playgrounds and the renovations of those courts mm -hmm. was just um, amazing. And it was a project that we took very, very seriously and kind of one of the crowning glories of our company. And I, and I owe that to Noel. And I, when I talk to kids, because once again, there's lessons in everything. And I tell kids, um, the things that they do in their younger years can come back and either help them or hurt them. Now, I'm sure if Noel knew me to be a jerk and an idiot back 50, 40, 50 years ago, he would have never reached out to me to do anything. So it's Correct. how you count yourself and, and, and some of the choices you make as a young man that will follow you throughout your, your life. So when he called us, I'm like, wow, this guy called us. Hey, he must kind of respect the company, but knows that um, he's going to be dealing with somebody or dealing with a company that's going to give him 100% of the effort. And we weren't going to stop until all of those courts were done mm -hmm. and done in the right way. You know, he kind of went a little fast over some of it. You know, some of those courts, we actually had to dig the holes to move the poles around so that they would be lined up properly and uh and some other things so i brought in another company to help us uh deal with that and um it really really is for me um 
one of the greatest feelings to be able to look up at a backboard on a court that I played on when I was eight, nine, 10, well, 10, 11 years old, that my mother used to look out the window just to see if I was all right. And that's the section one court by the Yellow Schoolhouse. And to be able to go over there and help renovate that and be a part of that project and then have the game over logo on every backboard. And then I, you know, I go to that park and I look up at that bedroom window on the fifth floor that I grew up in. And it's like, it's, it's unbelievable. And I think the greatest thing is, and I have to thank Noel once again for this, was I was able, my mother's going to be 90 years old in a few months, but I was able two you. years ago to bring my mother out to co op take her out to section four courts and point up to those backboards with, with mm. her, and take pictures of her standing right there. And um, who Love knew? It. It's like uh, this game has taken me around the world, literally yeah. around the world, but it's brought me back home and to be able to do things back home. Because the other thing is, is every court that we did, we did a free, we did a free youth basketball clinic in it. Yes. And yes. doing those clinics, I was able to hire some of the old timers like the Kevin Patrick's and the Lanier ah, Rodney yes. and Vince Williams to come and work for me to run these clinics. So yeah, uh, yeah. it's just all full circle and all so surreal. And even when uh, Noel tells the story just now, it almost brings tears to my eyes to think that, <laughs> you know, we did this. Yeah. We did this as yeah. a company. We were able to yeah. do it. So Great. it's like life has come for me, full circle, mm -hmm. being able to, to do those courts, man. Yeah. And I love when I drive by and I see them kids out there, man, it really, really, um, you know, they don't have the half moons, man. They got fiberglass backboards. Fiberglass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I remember. Right. And that's, that picture right there, that's just the one court. We did four other courts, four or five. Yeah, we did four yeah. or five other courts there. Yeah, in yeah one in each and section. They're all yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're all beautiful. Yeah, we, we went all out. Um, this you way, did. And, uh, yeah, you and and I think we need to emphasize that we've not really had any real trouble on those courts. No. Um, in, in any parts of the, I mean, you know, one event I think that I can talk about that it was a quasi negative, but other than that, I mean, the, the children have stepped up, and, and I think it's a it needs to be understood that that we as a people can raise good children. I mean, yes. you know. You, you yeah. see what's going on and, and, and the shooting and the looting and, and, and stuff that's going on in the subways or whatever. But I tend to believe when there's a loud yin, there's a quiet yang. Yeah. And, and in essence, um, what we've learned is that our, our, our children have stepped up in the manner that we hope they would step up. And particularly considering the pandemic restrictions that they have to suffer through. I mean, I, I it pains me for, for those seniors who, who were in 2020 and I'm worried about the, the, the abilities of, of student athletes in particular in 2021 yeah. um, to see if they get to play each other and, and do those sorts of things that made, made, made high school life great. Because it's not just the fact that you played on the team. It's those people in the stands who come see you, the, the people yeah. who chair on the side, the teachers, yeah. the parents that come in. You know, mm -hmm. it's an interaction, you know, in, in mm -hmm. Co-op City. The, the, the whole idea is people leave their apartments and go downstairs to do something. And most of the time for young men and, and at the time for young women, they went on the courts. That's right. They learned each other. You know, it, it, everybody didn't have to be NBA particular in that sense. You didn't, you know, although I played with some great guys, I played with some guys that, that you know, just loved the game but couldn't play the game, but you <laughs> still knew what to do with them. You know, I'm saying we, yeah. we got along and they, they fit in. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's a cultural aspect. We weren't paid to play street ball, so the demands are very much different in a pickup game. Um, Absolutely. But it's that interaction that that allows the children. I mean, that's how we met. You know what I'm saying? And and, yeah. and it's turned into a networking <laughs> ability that now I can reach out to young kids I watch grow up in Co-op City to help me in various endeavors for this particular community. Um, mm -hmm. Networking is the key. Holding yourself mm -hmm. up high is the key, and 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 walking proud and studying your craft. You know, Absolutely. you know. One thing I, I'd like to add to that at the end is, which was very important to me, and especially as a company and why the company was started, because Game Over is about the businesses behind sports that are not on the court, but the other yeah. things that you can do, and the fact oh, that seen, a black yeah. man is a general manager of Co-op City and calls another black man who owns his own company and can get this done 
Those yes. are the things that need to be seen, and those are the things I like the, the kids to see, that um, there is success in sports, and it's not always on the court. And I tell my kids that I deal with here in, in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, I tell them, I don't wish I was anybody. I don't wish I was Michael Jordan. I don't wish I was LeBron James. I don't wish I was any of them. I, I'm glad the path that I took in sports, and I'm very – fulfilled in what I've been able to do and what I've created and what I continue to create because my goal was to be the next Nike. It's not going to happen. Uh, 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 not going to be the next Nike. But some little kid that sees that logo and knows who I am or sees the company, knows the story of the company, is going to be inspired. Some little black kid somewhere will see it and they'll be the next Nike, Reebok, whatever it is, Under Armour, whatever it is, and it'll happen. So it's important. It was important to me to do this. And the way that it transpired is important for people to see and kids to see. They always say that we're crabs in a bucket sometimes when it comes to our own. But this mm -hmm. is a perfect example of uh, somebody having an opportunity to give somebody else an opportunity. And then I'm mm -hmm. able to give other people opportunities. And that's mm -hmm. how we really want to turn things around, is if we stick together and we share our resources and spread out the opportunities that we do have, as, as in you sharing your platform with uh, us tonight. I mean, this Absolutely. is a tremendous So uh, we just need to do more of that. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Rick, do you remember the time that we uh, made it up to Co-op City to watch the unveiling of the court that was that breathtaking or what? Oh, yes, it was. Lord <laughs> mercy. It was awesome. I mean, uh, not only, uh, you know, Noel being a homecoming, you know, right, seeing, right. seeing folks and whatnot, but just like, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, people came from all over the country, you know. Yeah, all over the country for that. Yeah, incredible, incredible. Yes, it was. So you know what? And, well, and the greatest this... story is just hearing you guys who played on these courts, and years later to create this opportunity for so many more kids like mm -hmm. yourselves. And I, and I'm listening to you, Noel, talk about how you've had no incidents with the kids, and mm -hmm. and, and and I know that that's because you showed the kids by not just words but by deeds example you no led them with example mm -hmm. and you created something for them and you showed them some people who look like them who mm -hmm. did it for them and i think that just created and opened up uh, um, a whole world for kids that we'll mm -hmm. we'll be seeing the results of this for years to come and probably mm -hmm. you know when we're gone you'll still see the momentum of this going on so i mean i i just have to uh, if I was wearing a hat, I'd take it off to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. you know what? In, in, the, in these closing moments, uh, please do tell, and to Eric, the program in Brooklyn. Tell me about it. Okay, so I was once again able, uh, very fortunate, a church built <clears throat> a $4 million basketball facility in the heart what? of Bedstock, Brooklyn. Yeah. Wow. And when they got to the point where it was ready to open up and go, they didn't know what to do with it. Somebody <laughs> brought me in and said, now, I was living half the time in Virginia Beach at this time. Oh, but wow. um, when they brought me, they said, listen, we need you to see something in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, and tell us if there's anything you think you can do with it. When I walked in and I saw that place, I was like, oh, my God, this is a dream come true. I wish it would have happened 20 years earlier, but <laughs> I can't walk away from this. So I took over this place. and. Um, Basically, they handed me the keys. It didn't cost me a dime. They nice. gave me the place, and we, we turned the place into a, a beacon of basketball in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, but it also carries my philosophy and the philosophy of the company. We teach the kids about more than basketball. And, um, you know, we have tournaments in there, and the kids get to videotape, and they get to interview kids. They help me design T-shirts. Uh, we got kids that help and learn how to coach. It's just a lot of the things that, um, once again, that are supporting products or the supporting things that go on behind the scenes of sports or running a building. I, we teach them. In fact, I got a group now that's running a tournament, in, a, a volleyball tournament in the gym right now, and they're so good I don't even have to be there. You know, I let the kid home to do this. So um, they're learning and they're making money. You know, they all get paid. You know, the greatest thing for me as a business is to be able to sign a paycheck and know that somebody can feed their family or a kid can have some money in their pockets and, and you know, all from two words and perseverance for a dream. And um, it's been a very rewarding thing. The Brooklyn Sty Dome is in bed Sty, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And you guys are welcome to come on out and take a look and get some shots up or just watch us train the kids. It's a great place. Okay. 
Hey, Eric, very, do you have a, a website where we people can learn more about Game Over? Yep, GameOverNYC.com. That's right. GameOverNYC.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram at official Game Over mm -hmm. NYC. Mm -hmm. Wow. So not and uh, the one thing that... Go ahead. Go oh, ahead I, I just wanted to say the, the one thing that the whole... Uh, 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 the 20 years out of my 28 years journey with Game Over, I traveled with a video camera. So yeah, I no. take everything. I mean, if he's playing in the NBA from mm -hmm. Steph Curry to Kimber Walker or this, that, and the other, I got them when they were kids. They got you Game got Over. Some footage. <laughs> and, and the thing is, is I had no idea. I go through footage and I'm like, holy cow. Mm. Like yesterday, I'm like, that's Kyrie Irving sitting on the bench there. And I walked right by him three times. I actually mm. sat next to him. Didn't even know who he was. If I had I known, I'd have given, I'd have given him uh, the microphone. I just posted on Facebook uh, an interview with a kid named Kyle Anderson when he was 12 years old. That's mm. on my Facebook page. I know wow. I, I did Kyle Anderson was one of the NBA. I must have talked to him for an hour that day and, wow. and take the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we collected a lot of stuff. So that, that kind of stuff you'll see on the website. That's great. So um, we've got to wrap things up here, but I want to thank you guys for uh, for joining us and uh, a great conversation, yes. really great example yes. of, of what we can do and what we have done. So I thank Eric Hicks, Noel Ellison, Rick Davenport, and of course, my partner, DJ Leroy. <laughs> so loud, prime time on WHC. Yeah. 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. <laughs> Check us out on our uh, so uh, on our uh, YouTube uh, um, uh, channel. We premiere. Uh, we are we we air at seven o'clock on Mondays, eight o'clock on YouTube, and nine p.m. We're on Clubhouse. So exactly. thank you for joining us. Check us out next week. And night watchman, I gotta there say, you. I love these brothers. I love yeah. you, brothers. Yeah. That, guys, thank you, guys. Yeah, my, my heroes. Heroes. <laughs> my heroes. My heroes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>